<clears throat> Hello and welcome to this short course on Python programming. We are going to discuss how to install Python and how to start programming using Python. But before we do that, let's see how why we should use Python programming and why the Python programming has become so popular. So Python programming has become popular not only among the software programmer community, but also non-programmers community. So people use software for variety of reasons for doing data analysis, for doing machine learning, data science kind of work. So not only the people who work in software field, but people who want to analyze, let's say, uh, social related data. So even they use Python and Python is the most, as of now, as of today, it is the most easiest uh, language to learn. So Python has a simple and readable syntax, making it accessible to beginners. And when you hear the word syntax, in the context of programming language, it means we're talking about the rules that one has to follow while developing the program. So when you talk about Java or C++, syntax is more strict. It is more complex compared to compared to python python has a very simple uh, syntax uh, python has a very large community um, uh, so if you have any so you can see this is my home page on my screen this is your uh, home official home page of python and all the information that you want will be available here so you have a community this is a very large community so let's say you get stuck somewhere community will come for your help. You can also look for jobs. Okay, so this website provides a lot of information. So the large and active community of developers who contribute to a vast array of libraries and frameworks. So what is libraries and frameworks? So libraries and frameworks are additional, you can think of as an add-on features, which keeps getting added to Python, making it preferred programming language for almost everyone. So whether you're looking to develop a website, you have Django and frame, you have Django and Flask framework for that. You're looking to develop, uh, um, <clears throat> you're looking to perform data analysis, you have NumPy and Pandas for that. You have TensorFlow and PyTorch frameworks for performing machine learning. So you have wide variety of add-ons or your or your libraries, which actually helps you to perform a lot of stuff using Python. So Python has become popular, not because it is easy, but also at the same time, it has a lot of features making everybody look up to Python. So with that introduction, let's go and see how, how we can download and work Python on your machine. So to download Python, you have to go to python.org website, okay? And then you see there's a download section here. So when you point your cursor here, you can actually see all these options on your screen. Mine is window machine, so I'm going to download this version for us today. But based on your platform that you are using, you can choose. So if you are using Mac, you go to Mac and then download the software. Or if you are using other platforms like Unix, you will have version for your platform kept here. So I'm going to download uh, this file from here. The download will be very fast. Uh, this Python installer is about 25 MB. So it's not very heavy. Now you'd be thinking that we're talking about so many features for Python and how can a 25 MB file provide all those features? So the idea is, yes, you need to download the basic Python first, and you can download and install your libraries or frameworks as you go along. So this does not come with say Flask or Django or PyTorch um, frameworks, but in case you need them for your work, you have to later download it. Okay, so that way making start of your Python simple, but then as you build your program, as you need more libraries, you can download them and use them. So our Python is already downloaded. I'm going to go to the location and I'm just going to double click on it. 
So installation of Python is as simple as that. You just double click on it. And when you double click on it, it will launch the installer, which looks something like this. So you have installer. Now this is a one click installer. That means if I say install now, it's going to simply install on my screen. It doesn't, you don't have to enter multiple stuff. So, but before I hit install now, I just want to let you know one thing that you see this path here, add, you see this option here, add Python exe to path, just check it. If you check this box, then Python will be added to your environment variables. So advantage of that is that, advantage of that is your third party software, or even when we launch Python, we can launch Python from anywhere. Third party softwares can search and find the path of Python. But if you don't do it, then we have to manually give the path of Python to these third party softwares, which might which we might use in future. And even to launch the Python, we have to go to the location where Python is installed. So if you see here, this is the default path which Python has taken. C users, HP, app data, local programs, Python, and then Python 3.1.2. So this is the latest version, Python 3.12.1, and this is going to get installed at this location. So if you don't check this box, then we'll have to remember this path every time. <laughs> but once you add this to the environment variable or, or to the path, then you don't have to remember this. Okay, so I'm all set and I'm just going to click install now. It will take some time. It will take a few minutes, five minutes or two to install. But then you saw just one click, that's it. Okay, and your Python will be installed in a few seconds. So let it get installed and then I'm going to show you how do you test whether your Python has been installed successfully or not. So let it get installed. Meanwhile, I also want to talk about different editors or notebooks that go along Python. So once we install and we'll see that it's not that easy, it's not user-friendly to work with Python prompt, okay? It can become complex because when we write a program, okay, it executes every line. So Python has, is a, Python is an interpreter language. That means it executes each line which is good when you're learning Python, okay, that you want to see the output immediately. You type up line and you see the output immediately. But when you become some expert and you want to write long, big programs, then you don't want Python to execute each line and, you know, it can be some, and it can be disturbance. So, so there are third parties which have created editors where you can go and write your entire lines of code without having any problem and then once you are done, when you want to execute it, that's when you call Python and Python will compile and run your program. So here there's nothing called compile step directly we run, okay? <clears throat> so we will see how to uh, use third party to directly run our program, okay? So, 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 for, so imagine um, editors to be like a very, advanced or a very advanced form of notepad. So notepad with a lot of features is, is like editor. Python also has notebook kind of thing. So when you hear Jupyter, you hear Collab, they are notebooks and they have a different way of execution. So we will see both of these type, okay, in next few seconds. But meanwhile, you can see our Python is successfully installed. So I'm going to say, close here. Now, now you can see that I am on command prompt. I went to a uh, Microsoft run, and I typed CMD. CMD will launch command prompt. So I can write instructions here for operating system, right? <clears throat> so we have seen Python is successfully installed, but I want to really test it to see if 
we can really use Python 3.12 or not, right? So I'm going to say Python. Now you see that I'm, I'm not moving my folder location to where the Python is installed. We install Python somewhere in app folder, in programs, in Python somewhere, right? But I don't have to remember it because I have added the location to the path. So since I've added the location to the path, I can launch Python from anywhere. You can launch Python from C drive itself. So I'm going to say Python. Now when you type Python and hit run on command prompt, you will see this three angular bracket or greater than sign. When you see this three greater than sign, it means that you have successfully installed Python and you are ready to work with Python now. So let's run our first command. So I'm going to say five plus three and hit enter. Now, the moment you, you hit enter, the program has run and this has given the output as eight. Okay, so this is how you get output pi. <clears throat> this is how you get output on your screen. We'll do a couple of more examples. And then we'll talk about the editors and notebook. So next I'm going to write another command. I'm going to write print. Python is case sensitive language. So by that, what I mean is the lower case and upper case have different meaning. Okay. So commands which are supposed to be given in lower case, you have to give in lower case only. You can't give in upper case. So print is our function and we have to give print. So print, as you can see, it, it is in lowercase, P-R-I-N-T, lowercase. Now, what is print, okay? This is the first command that we are learning in Python. So print is called as functions, or it is more specifically inbuilt functions. So inbuilt indicates that we are not working, we have not developed it, we are not the creators of print. Print is already created, okay? To, comes pre-installed with your software. So when we install Python, print comes along with the software. So it's not that we have written the code for print. <coughs> That's what inbuilt means. Function means it has a very specific purpose. So what is the purpose of print? Purpose of print is to display onto the screen. So what has happened is, the creators of Python, the people who have written Python program, uh, again, just for trivia, Python was first written in C, but now you have Python in Java and C Sharp as well. So Python, the creators of Python has written few specific lines of code and they have given it a name called print. So the function is simply a name given to few lines of instructions, few lines of code. So later in, in advanced classes, we will learn how to create our own functions. We call them as user-defined functions. So as a user, we define those functions. But this is inbuilt functions, okay? So developers of Python have already created this for us, and it has a associated lines of code which performs certain tasks. So in, in print, the certain tasks is to display onto the screen. Okay, and how do we use it? Print always, or for that matter, any function, user-defined or inbuilt function, will be followed by simple bracket open and close. And everything that we want to pass to the function has to be within this bracket. So I want to, again, perform 5 plus 3. Now, 5 plus 3 is the action I want to perform. <clears throat> and I want to print the result onto the screen. So to print the result onto the screen, I have written print. So print, and then, as I said, function have to be followed by simple bracket. So no matter which function you write, blindly function name, and then you put bracket open and close. So print, bracket open and close, and within the bracket, within the, uh, you know, before closing the bracket, we give what we want to display onto the screen. I want to display 5 plus 3, the value of 5 plus 3. And I'm going to go behind and then hit enter. So you see, you got 8. So there's no difference between just typing 5 plus 3 or doing print 5 plus 3. But when we do it on editor, 
okay python will not understand what is 5 plus 3 because in editors we are supposed to write print itself to display but again we'll see uh, when we go to editors but for now okay you see there's no difference between just typing 5 plus 3 or putting 5 plus 3 inside your print function great so we have learned to install python so far and we have learned our first command which is print in python now let's look at the other version of print now in this case in the second version i'm writing print bracket but this time i'm writing a single quotation and i'm saying five plus three single quotation is like apostrophe and then followed by five plus three and i close that quotation and i close the bracket so only difference between this print and the previous print is that the content that we gave 5 plus 3 is within quotation. Now, again, we will see later that there is no difference, absolutely no difference between single quotation or double quotation in Python. Absolutely no difference between single quotation and double quotation in Python. But we'll start with single quotation and later we will also see examples using double quotation. That's the only difference, right? We have added quotation. Otherwise, everything is exactly the same. And now I'm going to hit enter. So you see that? It displayed the content as it is. This time, it did not print 8, but it printed the content 5 plus 3 at a, as it is. So what we understand from this is, when you want Python to evaluate something, you want Python to think and evaluate or give you an answer, then you put, you don't put quotation. <clears throat> but when you want Python to print as it is, without, let's say, thinking, okay, whatever junk I give you, you print the junk onto the screen. That's when you use quotation. So I just said there's no difference between single and double quotation, so I can write another instruction bracket open, double quotation this time, and I'll put some junk character here. I'll close the quotation, close the bracket, hit enter. Whatever I gave within the quotation, exactly same thing is printed here. So Python is not even bothered bothering to check what you have entered. It's okay, whatever you enter, I'm going to dump it onto the screen without even trying to understand what you're trying to do, right? <clears throat> that's the purpose of quotation. Okay, so this is in a way uh, your text data and text data is displayed as it is on your screen. But when we don't give, then it evaluates. Now, Python can take multiple values. Okay, sorry, print can take multiple values. Okay, so I can give print here. And when I say multiple values, that means you can give, you know, without quotation, where we want Python to evaluate, and with quotation, where we don't want Python or print to evaluate. <clears throat> so each of these values in, in the language of function are called as parameters. So we can give one parameter, which is 5 plus 3, let's say equal to. 5 plus 3 equal to, and I close the quotation. So this is one parameter or one set of value that we are giving. I can close it, the bracket, and you get the output as it is. But in this case, I'm not going to close it, but I'll give a comma here. A comma indicates that you have more parameters to give. That means you have more set of values to give. Then this time, I will say 5 plus 3 without quotation. And for now, let's have just two parameters. I close the bracket and I hit enter. Now you see, 5 plus 3 equal to, we are given as one single text. So it printed 5 plus 3 equal to as a text. We gave comma. So comma is like a separator. We are separating 5 plus 3 equal to and the second value, which is 5 plus 3. The separator comma will have a space here. So the space that you see between 8 and equal to is because of the comma. And then 5 plus 3 without quotation, so it is evaluated and we get it here. So this is how 
you can use print to display a fixed text or a evaluated. Not only or, and also is valid here. You can print more than one value. So I'll do one more example before we move ahead. I'm going to say print 5 plus 3 is comma 5 plus 3 comma and 4 plus 4 is also close comma 4 plus 4. So I gave 5 plus 3 is as in quotation. So as it is, this is printed. 5 plus 3 is. And then 5 plus 3 here is replaced with a value 8. And then again, fixed text and 4 plus 4 is also. So add 4 plus 4 is also followed by 4 plus 4, which is 8. So you can give multiple values of quotation and non-quotation. That means evaluation and text. Okay. So I just said, there is no difference between single quote or double quote in Python. Absolutely no difference. You can use single quote or double quote. But what you have to remember is whatever you begin with, if you begin with single quote, you have to end with single quote. If you begin with double quote, you have to end with double quote. I can't begin with single quote and end with double quote. Or I can't begin with double quote and end with single quote. Single quote starting means single quote ending. Double quote starting means double quote ending. Okay. Otherwise, it's all fine. Okay. Now, <clears throat> we have seen few examples here, right? And, you know, it doesn't look that appealing. Okay. The, the editor that we are using, the Microsoft command prompt, is not that appealing. So, other developers, there are other uh, third party software companies, they have been developing different software so that our experience of writing Python program is much better. So I'm back on Chrome and here I'm going to open a new tab and type Top Python editors. Okay, so you see that these are top Python editors to write uh, software pro Python programs. You have Sublime Text, Atom, Vim, okay, Notepad, plus plus. But one which I use is called PyCharm. VS Code is also uh, another popular editor. VS Code for Microsoft is again free and very powerful. My favorite is PyCharm. So I'm going to go to PyCharm here. So when you go to PyCharm download, <clears throat> when you type PyCharm download into Chrome, it will take you to a company called JetBrains. So JetBrains is the company that develops PyCharm software. So I'm going to go to JetBrains. I'm going to click on download PyCharm. So here you'll find two software. You'll find PyCharm Professional. And if you don't, if you scroll below, you will see PyCharm Community Edition. So PyCharm Professional is a paid version. Okay, you have to pay, you have to pay fee okay, to use it. And when you're developing your applications for enterprises, that means your intention is to make money from your application. Then Py PyCharm says, okay, since you are planning to make money, then why don't you give me some money, right? So it is good and uh, <clears throat> it's ethical and legal to buy this professional edition if you are developing enterprise level applications. But if you are using it for learning Python, then you don't have to buy the professional. You, you need to download the community edition. In terms of features, both are equally good. Okay, so it doesn't matter which one you use, but for training and development, learning purpose, community edition is good. So again, you can download this software and after downloading, 
you install it like any software. So I'm not going to get into the installation of PyCharm. It is like installing any software. But I'll show you later how it looks like when you start using it. So um, I would recommend either you go for PyCharm or you can go with what we call as VS Code. VS Code is a Microsoft, so you can download um, uh, VS Code or Visual Studio Code, or you can go to Microsoft Store, and from there, you buy it. So that, again, that is free. So when I say buy it, that means you are installing from store, okay? The advantage of installing from store is that you don't have to worry about upgrades, okay? Your VS Code and you know, the latest version of VS Code will be maintained. But when you download it, you'll have to make sure that you are using right version. You have to make sure that, you know, in future you upgrade manually. So the best way to get VS Code is go to Microsoft Store and then install it. So you can use installation. Apart from that, we have other types of softwares called as notebooks. So the way notebook works is little different than editor. So notebooks provides advantage that the output can also be saved in the notebook. Editor, okay, you can only save the program. You don't save, you can't save the output. But in notebook, you can even save the output. So one of the most popular notebook is Jupyter. Notebook. So you can download Jupyter Notebook. Okay, so you have all the instructions here. So you install Jupyter Notebook. Now, from learning perspective, it doesn't matter which software you use. Okay, learning is independent of the software. This is like a tool which will help you to, you know, do your Python program. So, you know, you can download Jupyter Lab. You can download Jupyter from Jupyter Lab. Okay, so this is one way. Or there is uh, another way of doing program, which is called as Google Collab. You just say Collab or Google Collab. So Google Collab, okay, Google Collab, Collab Notebook, okay, this, this is a Google Collab or Google Notebook. Google Collab or Google Notebook is a way to learn programming online. Okay, so Google has provided us. Okay, so this is how you log in to Google. Okay, Google.collab. And for this, okay, you need to have Python install. Uh, so since Google is provided by Since Collab is provided by Google, you need to have a Google account. You need to have a Google account. And this Google account, okay. So first time when you log in, first time when you log into Google Collab, okay, you will have to log in using your Google account. But since I've already used Collab before, it did not ask me and directly took me to Google Collab. So this is how Google Collab works, looks like. Okay, this is how Google Collab looks like. Okay, and the notebooks will create files with extension IPNYB. So when you see extension IPNYB, which is interactive Python notebook, it means that you are using a notebook. Okay, I can call this as prog1. I can rename it. Now, you can see that this is a live internet version. It's a live uh, you know, version. So to work on Collab, you don't need to install any software. I spoke about installing Python first, and then I spoke about installing editor, okay, PyCharm editor. But if you are using Collab, you don't have to install any software. And especially when your machine is old, uh, and you know, it does not support the latest software, or... You don't have a machine you want to work with your phone itself then this is best okay you don't have to install any software you can start practicing your program from here itself okay see this is a box so when uh, jupyter notebook will look like same so what collab has done is it has put jupyter notebook itself as a ui 
Okay, so this is where we can start doing our program. So I'm going to write my first program, print, and I'm going to say five plus three equal to comma five plus three. Same thing which we did on command prompt. So when you hit run here, first time it takes time because it has to connect to the Google servers and give us the output. So first time it might take some time to execute, but second uh, line of code will be much faster. So I was saying that Google Collab, okay, advantage, you know, you don't have to save, or you don't have to install any software. And second advantage is the file is automatically saved in your Google Drive. So you don't even have to save it on your machine. It is available in Google Drive. And let's say when you, let's say you are studying with your friend at your friend's house and you don't have your laptop, you can get your programs from Google Drive there. You can connect from your friend's computer to Google Drive and pull the files here. So it is easy to share files when you're using Google Drive. Okay, so that's the advantage. You don't have to install any software and you don't have to save files on your local machine. Disadvantage is that you have to be connected to internet. Okay, you have to be connected to internet. Okay, and then you see this is Jupyter. Uh, I, I told you like notebooks. Notebooks will save the output here. Okay, now I can have, I can start doing coding in this block itself or I can create a new block here. So I can say print Hello, everyone. And now you run it. Okay, so it'll, it is much faster now, right? Okay, so this is how you can do program on your Google Collab. But I prefer to work PyCharm because, you know, I have full control over my, my files. I don't need internet to work with my files and it is all saved on my computer. It is safe and secure. So I'm going to take you to PyCharm screen now. PyCharm, after installation and creating project, will look something like this. Now, see, I have modified the color, look and feel. I have, I have, you know, changed the background color to white. I have changed the font. I have changed the font size as well. So this looks different. When you install your PyCharm, the default version of PyCharm will be much different than what you see on my screen. So it doesn't matter. Don't worry about the look and feel, okay? Focus on learning, okay? So yes, I have uh, created a file called P11 and this is where I'm going to write my programs. And you can see all my previous files here, okay? So PyCharm screen will have three parts. You have this left part, which is called File Explorer. File Explorer will show you all the files that you have worked in the past. This is the editor. This is where we will write our program. And this is what is saved. And at the bottom of the screen that you see, this is where our output will be displayed. Okay, so it has mainly three parts. And you can see the PyCharm files are called as .py. Okay, this is .py files. Awesome, so let's start our programming and all the programs from now on, I will do on PyCharm. But I just said, you are free to choose your own editor. You're free to choose your own notebooks. There's absolutely no difference in the programming, okay? Only the execution, the way you handle the tool will be different. Otherwise, code is exactly same whether you're working on PyCharm or you're working on Jupyter Notebook, you're working on VS Code, you're working on Google Collab, you're working on Mac. Doesn't really matter. The code will be exactly same, okay? So I just said, first, we will work with print, okay? So I'm going to say print, hello right and okay um, let's say i create a variable now we are going to learn the second concept called variable i'm going to say hello i'm going to say name equal to such it so what is name here name is a variable i'm creating name which is a variable and i'm assigning a value such into it okay 
Now I can write Sachin directly here, right? Hello, Sachin. I don't have to use name. And when I run P11, okay, see P11 is selected or I'll go to run and select run P11. So P11 file will run and you can see the output here. So you can say, uh, hello Sachin, but this name will not be fixed every time. Say hello as a message is fixed, but you want to keep replacing that name with based on the person who has logged into your website. So you log into um, say Amazon website, it'll tell you hello, your name, right? So the message that it is displaying on top right corner is fixed, hello and name. But this name will vary based on the person who has logged in. Okay, so that's why it doesn't make sense to put name as a fixed message, right? I can say hello, comma, name. So see, hello is in quotation, so it is printed as it is. Okay, I'm going to run this and then we'll discuss. So since hello is in quotation, it is displayed as it is. But you see name. Name is a variable and it is without quotation. Now, if I put this in quotation, so what happens? Then it says hello name, right? Because we put name in quotation. So it is hello name. Okay. But if I say print hello, comma, name, name is not in quotation. Since name is not in quotation and when I run it, okay, so it says hello Sachin, because name is not replaced with the value Sachin. This is what we gave in the beginning. This is what we gave in the beginning. So it replaces name with Sachin, right? This is called evaluation. So it is evaluated. Now, this is called variable name. And just like in mathematics, we say, right? Let's take x and assume its value is 5. There's something like that. Let's take x. So here we are saying let's take name and assume its value is such in. Okay. Now, okay. So, so far we have seen what is variable name and we have seen print function. The next thing I want to show you is what is called as comment. Now, comment can be one line comment or it can be multiple lines, multi-line comment. I want to write comment in one line, or I want to write comment in two lines, three lines, four lines. So there are two ways to declare comment. When you are dealing with comment in one line, then we write hash. So we say hash comment. But what does comment mean? So comment is the text which is not meant for Python or computer. Okay, then for whom it is meant? Okay, it is comments are meant for human being programmers. Okay, these texts are ignored by Python, but are very useful to the programmers. So you see that if you have to write one line of comment, this is how you do hash comment. And when you have to give multi-line comment, then we use triple quotation. So we are using triple quotation. Now triple quotation can be single triple or double triple, doesn't matter. But whatever you begin with, same thing you have to end with. So if you begin with single triple quotation, you have to end with single triple quotation. Okay, if you begin with triple, double, triple quotation, you have to end with double, triple quotation. But you have to use triple quotation, right? And you can have multi-line text. So I just said, if we execute this file, these lines are not even read by Python. Python will not even read. For Python, line number one is line number seven. You see, these are the line numbers. PyCharm is giving you the line numbers here. So line number seven is actually the line number one for Python. Line number one to six are comments which Python will ignore. Python will not even try to enter into this. Okay. 
these are meant for us. Now, see, you write a program today and you come back after six months or even two months, you might forget what you did, why you did. So these comments are very useful. Okay, so you can read your own comments and you know, okay, this is why I did that. Okay, this is the purpose of doing it. Now, in in uh, enterprise world, when you develop software applications, you will not be the only one working on the product, right? There will be multiple other software developers working with you. So if you do not write good comments, if you do not give the comments, other pro other programmers will find it difficult to understand your code. So comments, though not read by Python, are very important component of programming. Okay, it makes understanding of your own code or your colleagues code easy so my recommendation is use as much comment as possible don't use comments for simple stuff but definitely when you have something little complex you think that this you know in future you might find it difficult to understand why you did okay you put comment associated with that okay so i said name equal to searching okay uh, so this is i said we're assigning Okay, I'm going to write hash. Now, hash can be as part of your main program also here. So, this is the program, and now I'm putting hash. So, till here, Python will read, but Python will ignore what you read from here, what you write from here. Python will not read what you write from here. So, I'm going to say name is a variable which has the value such in. The Sachin is the value and name is the variable. One more thing you'd have noticed from so far is indentation. What is indentation? Indentation is the space, the number of space that you give before you write the first character of your program. Space before writing first character of your code, right? Or your instruction, code, instruction, code, instruction, program, okay? I'll be using uh, interchangeably these terms, but they mean almost the same. So indentation is the space before writing the first character. N is the first character. Did I give any space before N? No, I have not given. P, no, there's no space here. This P has no space here. So Python, okay, when you're writing these programs, you should not give a space before your first character. Now, there are occasions when we deal with blocks of code, right? When you do conditional statements or loops or when we declare our own functions. So, we have to define a block of code. There, yes, you need to give indentation. But in this scenario, you don't have to give instruction uh, indentation. Indentation is not required. So, that's why we are not going to give indentation or space before uh, P or N, okay? If you give here, let's say I give a single space here, and when I run it, you see, it says indentation error, unexpected. Python does not, it did not expect indentation, but you gave indentation, which is not right. So we don't give space here. Now, it doesn't matter after that, okay? Here you give space, it doesn't, have any impact on your program, your program is going to run just fine without any problem. Okay, so that's the important part of your indentation. Okay, so coming back to our line number seven, when we see name equal to such in, I said name is a variable. Variable means the value can change, right? Now I can say, okay, here name equal to Virat. And then I'll put hello name. Now the value of name became Virat. So here you say hello Virat. Okay. You can even read value from the user and we'll see that in some time. But before that, we need to understand different types of data or values. Right. We say Sachin is a value. Right. Sachin is a value or Virat is a value. Value generally we give on the right side. Variable is on the left side. And value we give the right side. In mathematics also we say x equal to 5. We don't say 5 equal to x. We say x equal to 5. That means we are assigning value 5 to variable x. Here too we are assigning value virat to variable name. That's, that's how we define names 
or value to a variable. Now, how many types of values can be there? Okay, at the basic form, and today we're talking only about the basic Python, right? At a basic level, you can have five types of values. Okay, so we can have five types of values. Sachin Virat is one such type. And what is this type called? So for that, we are going to learn another function called type. So type is uh, another function, it's very similar to print, right? It's an inbuilt function, but it gives you the type of the value, or we call this as data type, type of the data, data type. What is the data type of Sachin? Now, in this case, we don't say Sachin, but we say data type of name because name is a variable. So what kind of value name has? Right. So question would be, what kind of value does name variable has so answer is type of name so name printing name will give you the value of name but printing type of name right printing type so first we need to find the type of the data which name has and then you print it then you print it so i can say something like this i can say print type of data okay so print is the main function and inside this main function you have one more function called type so print has become outer function and this type has become inner function so when you have outer and inner first we deal with inner function okay you might have multiple level of functions you can have print type again type again type maybe so when you have multiple functions we always start with innermost function. First, innermost function will be evaluated, and then you go outer, outer, and outer. Finally, outermost function is evaluated. Same thing we do in when we uh, solve mathematical problem, right? Your mathematical equation can have multiple brackets. So first, we solve the inner bracket. Then the outer and outer. Finally, we solve the entire equation, isn't it? Same. Similarly here, we have print and type. So first, type is evaluated so type of name will give you what is called a string str str is a is a data type in python which represent text data so whenever you have to represent text data in, in the language of python we say string and we write it as str okay so let's run this and see what happens so see you have type given as str which is string now, it is not just str, but you have something called as class. Now, again, in, in object-oriented programming world, class has a specific meaning. It means that it belongs to a group called string. Okay. So, again, when we get into advanced programming, we will see what class means Okay, exactly and how to declare a class, how to work with class. We'll create our own class. This is, again, inbuilt class. str is inbuilt class. We will learn to create our own classes. But for now, just understand that string means group. It belongs to a certain group called string. So you have certain set of values and it belongs to that certain set of values. Okay, so we have str as a group and your name belongs to str. Okay, so that's the purpose of creating class. So now, str, okay. So we are looking at our first data type. Okay, our first data type is str, correct? Which stands for string and which means it can store text data. All text data in Python is treated as string or str. Okay, now how about numbers? Okay, so this is how we store string values, text values, but how about numbers? How do we store numbers? So we do store numbers using variables. Now I can use same variable equal to 5. Now I'm saying, okay, let's take a variable called n. No, sorry, let's take a variable called name and store value 5 to it. But you see, the variable name that we take should be, should have a 
meaning. We, you know, we should be able to guess what kind of value that variable has. But when you see name equal to five now, right? Name, generally we associate with people's name, right? But when you say five, it looks a little odd, isn't it? So maybe name is not a good variable to use here. And I'm going to use something like, let's say, quantity. So I know that, okay, quantity means, okay, you are talking about, okay, how many pieces, how many items, right? And here it is five. So logically, it makes sense, correct? Now, I want to know the type of quantity, what kind of value type variable has. So I will say print. And now I'm going to say uh, fixed text. So I'm going to say type of value in quantity is comma type of quantity. Okay. So type of value in quantity is, is a text is a, you know, in, in the quotation. So it is displayed as it is. Okay. And type of quantity, okay, will give us the type of quantity, which is class int. You see that? Int, okay. So int indicates integer. Indicates values without decimal part. Right? So integer are for numbers, okay, which indicates values without decimal part. Okay? So you see this, okay, we have seen string, which is used to store text data, and we are talking about quantity or an integer, which stores numeric data without decimal part. Now, you can have a situation where your variable can have, let's say, five in quotation. But look, the value is five, but it is in quotation. That means it has become a text. That's how you differentiate a, a integer from text. If the value is in quotation, it is always, always, always a text. Okay, when you have a value in quotation, it is always a text. So I can say print, okay, type of var one, right? And just to make sure that, you know, we are able to read the output correctly, I will put some text which we can associate while reading the output. I'm going to say data type of var1 is. Data type of var1 is string. So even though we are calling this as in quotation, even though we are putting this in quotation, but okay, even though we are assigning value 5 to var1, but we have put it in quotation. So quotation means it's a string and you get output as string only, not as integer. Okay, great. So now let's move on to our third data type. So third data type, okay, data type is called float, okay, which means it's a number with decimal values. Okay, so now I'm going to say here price equal to 13.85. That means the price is, now again, okay, based on the variable number, we should be able to guess what kind of values that you are storing. So I'm saying that here, I'm probably storing the price of every unit of item. And it is 13 rupees 85 paise, whatever way you want to read it. Okay, so you can read it in your own specific currency. So 13.85. Okay, now this means that you're dealing with float type, correct? So I can say print type of value in price is, and then you say type of price. Now when I run it, you see, it says float. It says float. So float means you have a value in decimal part. Okay? Now I can write a variable by creating using formula. So I can say total price. Total price 
is price per unit, which is price, into multiplication into quantity. Okay. Now, later we will also see other forms of um, operators. So, this is called an operator. Okay. The multiplication is called an operator. And we will see other forms of operators like um, plus, minus, into division, you know, finding square. Uh, finding square, square root, finding, uh, you know, remainder. Okay, so there are different ways of doing it. We'll see later when we get into details of operators. But now I wanted to show you that your variable names can also be dependent on another variable name. So it's like saying, let x be 5, let y be 10, and calculate z as x plus y or x into y. Right, so calculate z as x into y. So now if I print here total price, I'm going to say total price equal to total price. And when you run it, you see, you get 69.25. Right? It has multiplied these two and you get this value. Now, advantage here is, let's say the price here increases to 14 rupees 85 paisa. Okay. And now when you run it, this will automatically change. See, it was 69, it became 74. You didn't have to change at multiple places. Even though I'm using price at multiple places, I'm in this case, I'm using price as two places, right? Here and here. But I changed at only one location and both of these values got changed because we are referring to the variable name and whatever value you put in the variable name, that will be reflected all across, right? So this is how you can use variables to perform calculations and advantage of using variable names is if there is a change in the price, if there is a change in the variable name, you don't have to change at multiple places, but just at one place and everywhere else where they, they are referring to this variable will automatically have a new value. Okay. So yes, there are two more things we have to talk about. You know, we have only looked at the third data type. We'll also look at fourth and fifth data type. So fourth data type is your, what do you call as Boolean or we call this as bool. It has just two values, true and false. Many a times, okay, and this is very useful in programming world. And when we start doing next level of programming, you will see that, you know, multiple places we use Boolean, okay? When we have to deal with yes, no kind of situation, yes, no, or true or false kind of situation, then we use Boolean, okay? Boolean means bool, two, right? So I can define is prime and I say false. So in a way, I'm creating a flag kind of variable. I'm going to check whether it is yes or no. So I'm saying is prime, is it prime? Answer is no, right? Now, if I need to know the type of is prime, I can say, okay, is prime data type is, and then I'll say type of is prime. Okay, now when you run it, you see, it says class bool, bool or boolean. It will have either true or false. Okay, either true or false, right? Now, okay, here you see I've given a text, right? You expect this to be in quotation, but not in case of boolean. Okay, all text has to be in quotation except two, uh, uh, you know, two values or two text, which is one, your false, another true. And that too, in this particular case only. So when you are referring to Boolean values, false or true, then we have to write first character capital and rest small. Okay, first character has to be capital and rest small. First value capital, rest small. I cannot say here, you know, small. Now, when I put this as small, then in this case, it is no longer your Boolean value true. See, PyCharm is intelligent. That's why we use editors, okay? They are meant to be intelligent. They will mark errors. They'll suggest, okay, uh, what content should come, okay? It makes our life 
much easier to program. Okay, that's why we use editors or uh, notebooks. So now see, you know, before I could run this program, before I could execute it, Python or PyCharm is suggesting me that what you have done is wrong because, okay, this is not a Boolean and this is not a string. So your text, okay, has to be Boolean or string, okay? So you have to deal with this value as it is. You have to put this in a quotation. Then it becomes a string. So let me put this in quotation here. And now I'm going to say, okay, that now the data type of is prime is is prime. You see here, it is not string because we put in quotation. Now, what if, if I put this in T capital, but since it's still in quotation, it is going to be string only. So what you do, you delete the quotation. You delete the quotation, now you run it. Since you delete the quotation, it has become Boolean. In quotation, it was string. Okay, so this is your fourth basic data type. The last one under basic data type is called complex. Okay, now complex is square root of minus numbers. Okay, so when you're dealing with square root of negative numbers, we call them as complex numbers or, uh, you know, um, we call them as complex numbers. And uh, in Python, they are represented as J. And uh, in mathematics, if you remember, we write I. So in mathematics, we represent as I, okay, for iota. But in Python, we represent, in Python, we represent complex numbers as j. So if I say here, um, number one equal to, number one equal to uh, 4j. Now if I print the data type, data type of num1 equal to type of num1. Okay, now when you run it, you see, it is complex, right? We are dealing with complex numbers. So, okay, complex number means it is the square root of minus one. Now, if I have to print, I'm going to say square of num1 equal to, so how do you calculate square? You have to say num1 into num1, right? When you multiply the same number with itself, it becomes a square number, right? So when I say num1 into num1, you expect it to be like 4j into 4j, which is going to be 16j square. Correct? Now, j square, I told you j is root of minus 1. Correct? So j is root of or square root, right? Root means obviously square root. Correct? Root square root of negative 1. So j square would be minus 1. So this is going to be minus 16, correct? 16 because of 4, 4 square is 16. j square becomes minus 1. So it becomes minus 16. Now you see, we started with a complex number and we are ending with an integer number, okay? Integer number, this is no decimal point, right? So it is integer number. Integer number or complex, or, or complex number or your float number since numbers, it is all like negative, positive, zero, all are valid, correct? Now, minus 16 is an integer, I just said, but we started with complex numbers, so we have to make this also as complex. So we say 16 plus 0j. This is 0, okay? 0j. Zero J J means it's a complex, but there's no complex number, so we put 0. But since we are putting j, since we are putting j here, it becomes a complex number. So the output of your num1 into num1 is going to be minus 16, which is integer value, and plus 0j. This is how we deal with complex numbers. So 
With that, we stop our discussion about basic programming. So far, we have seen how to install Python or what to install other software like Notebook and uh, Editor. We started with talking about print as a function, the purpose of print. We moved on to discuss about commands. We discussed about the type function, which gives the data type. And we discussed how to declare a variable and the value. And then towards the end, we discussed about five basic data types, right? We started talking from string, then we spoke about integer, float, complex, and Boolean, right? So, so complex, integer, and float, these are your numerical data type, three numerical data type, your string is your text data type, and Boolean is to handle yes-no situation. Now, why do we need to know the data type? We need to know the data type because based on that only you can decide what operations can be performed on these variables. So for example, if you are dealing with numerical value, we know where we can multiply and we can divide two numerical values. But when you start with a Boolean value, you cannot perform multiplication. You can't perform multiplication, right? Boolean has its own set of operators. So we'll see when we get into next level, we'll talk about uh, and or not. These are operations that we perform on Boolean values. Similarly, when you talk about string or text, we, it has its own set of operations. You can perform concatenation, putting two strings together. We'll see how to convert into lowercase, convert into uppercase. We'll see how to split the text into multiple forms. But those are the properties associated with string. So if your data is of type string, only then we can perform those things, right? So it is very important, uh, no matter whether you are doing programming in Python or any other programming language, it is important for us to know the data type because the rest of the operations that you'll perform depends upon the nature of the data. So with that, we end our discussion here and we will now We'll talk about other parts of Python in different video. Thank you.